This is Hong Kong. And this is Sam Say, a retired steel broker who's made his fortune in Hong Kong. Earth Report travels with him to Laos as he searches for new investment opportunities in the country of his birth. Sam's already gambled $4 million on a coffee farm. He wants to bring coffee from Laos, once championed by the French as the best in the world, to the fashionable cafes of Hong Kong. Sam's not the only one betting on Laos. Foreign investment into Laos has quadrupled to $4.3 billion last year, most of it going into the commercial exploitation of resources. But Laos is one of the last biodiversity treasures in Southeast Asia, boasting the highest number of large mammals in the region and over 50% of the world's vascular plant species. The question is, will it all be further threatened as this cash turns the land into capital? Sam Say is an exile from Laos. Our family left Laos in 1977 as refugees. So we'd uh, end up in a camp in Thailand for two years. We lost everything we own. Laos was not in my heart at all for a long, long time. At times in the past, I struggle because coming from Hong Kong and also in Canada and the US and coming back to a very, very poor farming community in Laos, I've also come to accept that I am a citizen of the world. Sam, like many refugees, fled the communist takeover in 1975. His journey back to Laos is not only a matter of the heart, but of the head too. Laos is resource rich, but grindingly poor. The size of the UK with only six million people, every second child in the rural areas is chronically malnourished. Now with his coffee business set, Sam's looking for other ways to invest in his homeland. At this stage of my life, an investment has to be ethical. It has to consider more than just making a profit. It's about investing in people and uh, making it better for people. And also to promote biodiversity um, so that the environment will be well cared for. As Sam drives to his coffee farm, he passes through a 250 hectare single crop plantation of well over 100,000 rubber trees. These large plantations of rubbers, you can drive all day and um, still keep driving. This is how large they are. From a commercial point of view, these plantations, they are impressive. They've done very well, um, very well managed. But again, they are single crop. This land would once have been covered in natural forest, rich in biodiversity. Since the 1980s, logging and converting land to single crops, such as rubber, has slashed forest cover here by 15%. In the last five years, it's accelerated as foreign investment floods into the country. Looking at the large-scale monocropping uh, plantation model, um, what I am fearing is that we will lose the biodiversity of this country and also a way of life for our people. What we're seeing here is about a thousand hectares of uh, monocropping of coffee and it's uh, chemical dependent uh, for pesticides and uh, chemical. So it's, um, this is one of the major concerns when uh, people come in and invest big money and do monocrop and just inject a lot of chemical into the soil. Development is happening at pace all across the country. The Laos government is transforming the capital, Vientiane, refashioning the riverfront. But its policy on land use and the sale of concessions is complicated. 
As acting head of the government's National Land Management Authority, Chantavi Intervong has a struggle on his hands. There are already more than 1,030 projects already in, approved by the government in the country uh, for investment into tree plantation or agroforestry plantation, including rubber. But most of this project is a land speculation. The government has to slow down or stop the new uh, approval of new concession because we found that there is already too many, too many already, but uh, the concession has been issued without the prior proper land use zoning plan. But for the foreign investors, it's just too lucrative and the government needs the money. So this is all coffee countries now. If you have money, you are welcome to invest in the land development in the country. But if you are a big investor, you got a special lane, fast lane. That's why uh, most of uh, it seems that like um, uh, foreign investment uh, get more privilege than allow. From a steel trading commodity background, I know absolutely nothing about farming. So. The internet was a great tool to learn the very basic at the very beginning. Connecting with consultants who know about uh, farming and also organic farming. This is very interesting, all the cherries. Sam has 67 yeah. hectares, 130,000 coffee trees. The soil is very workable. Uh, with our population base, we really don't need to do large scale farming. Um, but to focus on quality and higher prices. Matured berries. I see. It's a small farm. Sam will have to triple the normal coffee yield per hectare. He needs a hundred tons to break even. He's relying on organic farming to increase productivity and replicate biodiversity. He produces his own fertilizer and plants shade trees and cover crops to nourish the soil. Even that's not enough. He can't grow enough coffee himself. He trains other local farmers to grow coffee his way to get the amount of coffee he needs. If the plan works, in three years, Sam will get his 100 tons. Anything above that is going to be pure profit uh, going forward. So if we can do 200 tons, we will probably be generating about a 1.5 million US per year profit. They are friends who are interested in what we're doing and interested in purposeful investments in country of Laos. So I'm heading up to the north of Laos to see and to explore what are available and what people are doing up there. And hopefully to learn from existing model that we can perhaps apply here as well. On Sam's trip north to Luang Nam Ta province near the Chinese border, he travels with the expert botanist and small agribusiness specialist, Dr. Soon Torn. Sam wants to see how farmers there are turning their land into capital and if it meets his criteria for investment. But it's a tricky area for the foreign investor, a place where anything can happen. Uh, transportation, huh? Eh? Yes. <laughs> Just uh, running a little bit, and then <laughs> collect back. Yes, yes. collect yes. back. <laughs> On the way, a surprise that delights the botanist. Oh. He spots a plant he doesn't recognize. <laughs> Medicinal plant. I'm trying to look at the inside, if it's white or red. I think this could be a medicinal plant. Oh. Okay. Yeah, medicine plant. Mm. <laughs> ah. Talking to a local confirms Soon Torn's suspicion that it's a medicinal plant. Its wood is boiled, then used as a cure for stomach ache. This is one of thousands of undocumented species in Laos. Many here cherish such rich biodiversity. 
Aitan, is this a new species? Um, this is uh, for me, is a new species. Okay. For me or for my institute also. Okay. Sam and Sun Thorn arrive in Hue Zai in Bokel province. It's the Golden Triangle, where Laos meets Thailand meets Burma. Investment is flooding in, bringing Chinese casinos, tourists, cash. The Golden Triangle, once notorious for its role in the opium trade, has now become the Wild West of investment. And for many here, it's rubber. Farmers and investors are betting that demand from China's motor industry will outstrip supply. So rubber is being planted here at one of the fastest rates in Asia, a lot of it illegally. It's a sight that upsets Sun Thorn. As a botanist, I've seen many parts of Laos, and I don't think the country manages its biodiversity properly. This is because many people ignore the biodiversity policy laid out by the government. This slope is steep, between 35 to 40 degrees. It's too steep for planting rubber. This is contrary to the land use classification and illegal. But not everyone is planting illegally. Investors, such as the Laos-China-Japan Trading Corporation in Hue Zhai, have been working with local officials to identify small landholders to invest in. <laughs> One of the partners, 78-year-old Antonio, was trained in his teens as a kamikaze pilot. Luckily, they ran out of planes before he could fly. After 11 years and nearly $800,000 of investment, we have 31 villages. That's nearly 2,000 families, all contracting to plant rubber with us. Every farmer gives only a part of his land over to rubber. It's an alternative to the big monocrop plantations, and biodiversity is preserved. Latex. If everything goes well, when the rubber trees are in full production, I'll need one year to get my money back. The company provides farmers with rubber saplings and technical help, and buys the rubber latex when it's tapped. The farmers supply the land and the labor. The split is 70-30 in favor of the farmer. On paper, a good deal. Or is it? Growing rubber is tough. It takes seven years for rubber trees to mature, and the seedlings demand non-stop back-breaking weeding. The farmers will have to work nights collecting the rubber when the trees start producing latex. They have to be up at 3 a.m. to tap the rubber when it's cool enough for the latex to flow. If they manage all that, they could earn 12 to 1400 US dollars per hectare per year. That's over twice what rice pays. But some farmers aren't so happy with rubber. Meet Tong. He's a contract farmer for Chu and is unhappy at the way things are going. He's gambling one of his five hectares on rubber. The remaining four provide food for his family. Everything on his breakfast table, the snails, forest rat, mushrooms and bamboo, are from the forest. My decision to plant was encouraged by the government and the company. They told us of the benefits of rubber and compared it to the success in China and that we had to find ways to improve our livelihood.
Based on the way things are, I'm not very happy. It depends on your land, and mine's not that good. The trees are not growing very quickly. I'm not satisfied, and I'm not sure that it's worth my time or the hard work. Chu, in turn, has problems with Tong. He's not sure Lao farmers will actually get up early enough to tap the rubber. I feel that the financial motivation of $6,000 a year is probably the only thing to get people up at 3 a.m. and working until 8 a.m. and finish the day's work. The investors also have a problem. They must raise $2 million for a processing plant to turn the latex into rubber. We are actually contracted to purchase the liquid latex in the contract with the farmers, so having a processing plant is vital. If we don't have the processing plant, we would not be able to fulfill the buying of the latex. That means my return on my investment would be zero. Also, if the farmers don't tap their latex, their own investment is zero as well, as they have put in the sweat equity and the land. So basically, everything is linked together. This is New Year dinner. If I were to look at this model and to invest financially and for only financial return, the answer is no. The risk is just too many, there's too many moving parts to manage. But if it is for social impact, then I want to see it succeed so that the farmers become successful, the company becomes successful. If it is becoming successful, then it would be a model that the government can push forward, that contract farming would work. Between working an upland rice field and thatching roofs, Chan Porn, Tong's wife, has her own take on gambling one hectare of the family land. I don't know what the risks are in planting rubber. If it doesn't yield latex, then we just dump it or wait 30, 40 years and sell the timber. Tong hopes it won't come to that. If the company is not lying, and the trees produce, and the price of latex is high, if everything they promised is real, then our livelihood will be good. <laughs> It'll be four years before anyone knows if their rubber gamble pays off. Sam and Sun Torn continue their journey east along Route 3 to Ban Nam Ping in Udom Side province. Sun Torn wants to show Sam a project he set up 10 years ago and see whether it's still working. It's another possible way for Laos to develop and keep its biodiversity. How long have you not been to the village? No, nearly five years. <laughs> you think they'll recognize you today as we arrive? Mm, <laughs> I am thinking that many people will come back in calling my uh, name. Yeah, my yeah, okay, name. Okay. Mm. Oh, so thought you are coming. Ah, you are back again. We are very happy to receive yeah, yeah. you. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, Ban Nam Ping was poverty stricken. Its people didn't have enough to eat. And yet they were sitting on what for them would turn out to be a gold mine. The village has over 400 hectares of prime bamboo forest, a valuable resource if you know how to market the shoots. The government sent in Sun Torn to help develop a business. And today, the village is thriving. They have electricity, a good school, and many motorbikes. So we're here? Yeah, yeah, we are at the village. Before Sung Torn arrived, villagers bartered the bamboo shoots for cloth or a few sweets. They had no concept of selling by the kilo. They didn't even have the scales. Oh. 
They were using a bartering system. They didn't have the skill to weigh the bamboo. I brought them weighing scales and taught them how to set a single price and sell it as a collective. Today, they sell their produce for a good price to a Chinese distributor. Yeah, I have seen some own friend of mine. Mr. Tui is the former village head. <laughs> Bitter bamboo shoots are highly sought after by the Chinese for their distinctive taste. The villagers only harvest the shoots for four months. The rest of the year, they close the forest. Oh, like that, no? Like. Bitter bamboo is good business. It doesn't need fertilizer. New shoots grow on their own, so there's no replanting, and harvesting is easy. And it grows alongside other forest products, like mushrooms and cardamom. Marketed, it's useful extra income. One hectare can produce about $200 a year. <laughs> this one's the tasty one, right? Yeah, yeah, this one's sweet. Can you eat it raw? Yes, yes, you can eat it raw. This is so good. And this is raw. And it's absolutely tasty. Refreshing. And I can eat this for lunch. I used to save my life from this during I lost in the forest. Mm -hmm. Half day, didn't have anything with me. Yeah. Sad <laughs> It's even tastier if you dip it in salsa. <laughs> for Sun Torn, Ban Nam Ping is a success, and it's still working well. They don't need rubber or foreign investment. If a company wants to plant rubber in this entire place, I would not allow it, because I want to preserve the bitter bamboo forest. The forest is our life. We depend on it. We have to protect it. It's our life. You don't want to destroy it. The government have committed, would like to have a poverty alleviation by the year 2020. And if we properly utilize our land and natural resources, including the biodiversity properly, we can really definitely uh, help to improve our people's livelihood as well as the macro economy. <laughs> To get out of poverty, there is no evidence that large-scale monocropping can do it with certainty. But integrated farming at the family level, like this village, can yield results within a year. I don't think this village needs investments. They're doing well on their own. I think we can do something for them. We can actually try to brand the village. When people hear about Ban Nampeng or village Nampeng, they would directly know that it's for bitter bamboo, that it's first class. There's a great possibility that we can help them design, brand and promote it. The journey is over for Sung Torn. Sam still has to keep his promise and return to Hong Kong to brand and market the bitter bamboo.
I think a lot of time we're tempted to measure up to what international measurement is in terms of growth economically. I think we also have to be mindful that we are a very different country. There must be a balance between driving GDP growth and also to, um, uh, losing what we have, which is much better than what developed country um, may or may not have. So we, I think we have to find a balance there.